Oh, great. Oh. Wow. This was... Good afternoon, Slush. <laughs> How are you doing? Great. So, how many of you know what impact, in, what impact investing is? Well, you're going to find a lot about it in the next mm. half an hour. We, we've got some incredible speakers lined up today, and um, I'm going to ask each of them to do a very brief introduction on themselves, and then we'll go straight into questions. So, Anna, do you want to... Um, you've, you've, you, you have a long experience from impact investing as CEO of the Sweet Fund, as the deputy CEO at Norshkin, and now the chair of Summer Equity. Do you want to just say a little bit about your background experience and skills? Uh, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Anna Riot. Uh, during the last uh, 10, 15 years, I have tried uh, to fight poverty and climate change through different kind of platforms. Everything from the business side, from the UN, civil society. But I have figured out the last uh, seven years that if I should do this most efficiently, because we are running out of time, we are in a hurry when it comes to climate change and fighting poverty. We should use all forces of investing. Today, only 1% of the capital, of the VC capital, for example, is going to Africa. So using the tool of investment as an enabler to drive change, and particularly focusing on technology to scale those challenges. And I do that today at Summa Equity. Uh, so my equity focus on, uh, on solving global challenges. And it's quite interesting because at Summa, we see that some of the largest challenges in the world are also the greatest business opportunities. So looking at three investment teams is our focus. The first one is around climate change and resource efficiency. The second one is, is around changing demographic, so everything around the health, education, and so on. And the last one is, is tech, tech and system. So all these three teams. And we truly believe by investing in these teams, we can also deliver higher or at least as high return as any other private equity firm, because these are real challenges. There are real gaps in the market that we can uh, sell and at the same time make a lot of money of to course. say. Yeah. So Andrew, you're a venture partner at Obvious Ventures based in San Francisco. Um, just a little bit about your track record, why you do what you do and what, what makes Andrew, Andrew. Yeah, sure. Um, so hello, my name is Andre. I am an American Andrew. working at Obvious. My background has been in uh, two parallel tracks, actually. Uh, one has been traditional philanthropy, so that's uh, charitable giving, where uh, we, it's, it's like non-profit venture, you could say. Um, and the other has been on the sustainability track. Um, that ultimately took me to Sweden, where I co-founded the first pan-Nordic clean tech fund uh, in 2008. Uh, the thesis being that the problem is now, we're running out of time even 10 years ago, and yet the Nordics had a lot to offer uh, by way of uh, experience uh, in, mar in servicing markets with what are considered environmental technologies. Um, at Obvious, we broaden the scope through what we call a world positive lens. Mm. So it's effectively uh, having an impact on the resources side of, of the equation, but also on uh, human uh, well-being in terms of health and also in terms of uh, empowering people to pursue uh, fulfilling lives uh, and creative ones. Very nice. Yeah. So just a little bit about um, where I fit into this picture. Um, I used to be a Wall Street banker. I gave that up and moved to South Africa about eight years ago. Uh, I now run the, or co-run the largest accelerator outside of the US. It's called Startup Bootcamp in 20 countries across the world. And we just launched our Africa operations two years ago. What we essentially do is we understand what African entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs solving traditionally African problems need to scale. And one of the biggest limitations is access to market, not just access to funding. 
and how important is impact as a measure of success. So we work with large insurance companies, banks, retailers, and telcos all across the world, but specifically in Africa, and help entrepreneurs scale and get traction early on, and more importantly, validate a good product market fit. One of the, the things we'll talk about shortly is how does impact measure from a return perspective versus traditional VC. And um, outside of that, I do quite a bit of angel investing uh, into African tech startups with the ultimate goal of having a triple bottom line return, economic, social, and ecological. So speaking about impact, uh, it is obviously a very hotly contested and debated term. Um, Anna, I'll start with you. What, is, what does impact mean to, to you personally? Um, and for some equity and some of the other uh, firms that you work in, and why is it important to you? Why is it important for the planet to look at impact at the same footing as just common returns? Uh, so if I start there, why is it important? Uh, I would love you all to close your eyes for just 10 seconds and imagine if we are going to fulfill the UN Global Goals. That means that within te uh, 12 years, we will have a world without extreme poverty, zero hunger, education for all, healthcare for all, equality, and we have managed to save the planet. This is one of the most beautiful vision we have right now. And at the same time, we have a world falling apart with extreme poverty, with a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to war and climate change and so on. And uh, increasing racism here in Nordics, increasing uh, nationalism in the Europe and so on. So I believe that all of us should use every platform we have to be part of this beautiful vision of uh, getting a better planet for people uh, and environment. So that's the reason why it's important for me. And that's also very in line why it's important to Summa. Uh, Summa believes that investing in global challenges will not only be extremely important, but it will also give our LPs and investors the best type of returns. And the reason why is because it's future proof. Yep. And with that, I mean that if the world is going to take the path of the global goals, we can't continue investing in things that harm us. We really need to shift all the capital, the private equity capital, the VC capital, pension funds, into companies, entrepreneurs that have a solution of some of the global challenge. So that is uh, our vision. And then if you call it impact, yep. or positive uh, investing, or solving global challenges, that is not so important to me, obviously, uh, honestly. It's more important that everybody think about how can I use my platform as an entrepreneur or investor uh, to make a change and be part of this positive moment. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just before I get to you, uh, Andre, one of the things that I speak about often is about how the, the world's population is growing at a dangerously um, exponentially high level outside of um, Western Europe and the US. Um, in the next 80 years, Africa will account for almost 35% of the entire world's population. The population of Nigeria is going to surpass the US in 2050. Um, out of the 20 largest cities in the world, 12 will be in Africa. So you have a problem where infrastructurally, you cannot solve things like healthcare, education, food security, transportation by building more roads or schools or hospitals. You can only so solve that through technology, through software, through the sharing economy, through telemedicine and things like that. So it's very important to understand how you use technology to do good and at the same time create economic wealth. So in your experience, I mean, how important is impact uh, from an investment standpoint at Obvious and yeah. how do you think um, you're making a difference? So um, I think echoing a little bit what Anna mentioned, one of the advantages of having um, a high conviction around what the world will need 
in the future allows you to map um, areas of interest for further exploration and following. Yeah. And, and that's actually an advantage, particularly around socio-ecological uh, questions, where um, most other venture capital, it's very difficult to look down, and ar down the street and around the corner. So people talk, rightly so, about the disruptive power of artificial intelligence and things that are happening now. But the question is, how do you apply those disruptive technologies to solving what problem or delivering what service that the future will mm. value and pay for? And so from our perspective, looking through this world positive lens, we can then say, OK, if you want to find a real dream company, maybe there's an entrepreneur in the audience who's got this, to take healthcare as an example. Yeah. What could be, um, what disruptive tool can we use to enable a healthcare solution that works not only in the developed world, where for different reasons we have high costs, but we have barriers to entry and access issues in other countries mm. that may not have yeah. the, the, the kind of developed world healthcare system. And then you have something that's applicable to both. Uh, renewable energy is a classic case in point. So, uh, or mobile phones, the classic case in point, where all of a sudden uh, it was so cheap that you never had to build the infrastructure Correct. that we inherited when yep. we grew up in the world of... Uh, and I think it also boils down to the, the concept of building nice-to-have products versus need-to-have uh, products. And the, the 90s and 2000s, and arguably part of the, the first half of this decade, Silicon Valley has, has almost created this need for entrepreneurs to build things that are nice-to-have. And I, I give this example often about a friend of mine that's, that built a drone technology that would, and this, I kid you not, this is true, where this drone would deliver organic smoothies to a high-rise office in San Francisco. And he raised millions and millions of dollars because there was a demand for it, but it did no good whatsoever. And I said, why, why don't you use that exact same technology to deliver ARVs to villages all over Africa mm. and do good and use technology to create something positive? The returns may be a bit longer, mm. five to seven to 10 years versus two years, but it still creates a positive change. So. In your opinion on that point, are there, are there different measures of impact depending on what geography you're looking at? So does impact in Sweden differ from what impact means in the middle of Africa or in Latin America? Um, is it important to have a more broader culturally sensitive lens when you measure impact? So the very easy answer on that is yes. Uh, and again, if you don't uh, look at impact as a uh, particularly sector or uh, strange thing over right. there, yes, of course. but instead of focusing on solving global challenges, then it's quite simple because there are in the different countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the challenges are different uh, compared to here in Sweden, compared to in China. And then you should absolutely focus on the largest challenges within your market or globally. So for example, looking at Sweden, uh, we would probably not do invest in a fintech company. But having spent a lot of time in, in sub-Saharan Africa, I believe that fintech is one of the really most powerful tool when it comes to impact. Absolutely. Because financial inclusion is sure. so important and driving change and reducing poverty and, uh, and it's good for inclusion. Yep. And that's the same with, uh, with uh, energy sure. yep. as well. I mean, I mean less than 5% less than of people in sub-Saharan Africa have access to formal insurance or banking. Mm. And those are problems that governments cannot solve that corporates can't solve, but startups and venture capital can solve. So this concept of private philanthropy or venture philanthropy is probably another way of describing yeah. exactly. Yeah. And yes, one uh, completely. And another example, I think, with circle economy uh, and waste management, for example, yep. that is probably needed all over the world. So there you can start with, uh, with uh, a company in Africa or in the Nordics and make sure you scale Absolutely. it globally. So, so you have uh, both problems that are really universal and then you have land-specific problems. Yeah. I, I would also okay. add that the, the question perhaps isn't so much uh, is, is impact different in different geographies as much as it is um, does venture capital 
with the expectations of venture returns <coughs> map on to impact investings geographically? Yeah. And the answer is not always. Uh, it, not always in the developed world and not always in the developing world. Yeah. And so it's really a case by case scenario. The, the real pitfall is when someone thinks that if I want to raise money, I just need to go to venture capital. The, the real question is whatever business you're in, even if yeah. it's non impact, do you meet the really, you know, the, the rigorous return targets that venture capital requires? And if not, you may be able to make a very good business case for receiving lots of money for impactful change, for example, in microfinance loans. Yep. So there's, as you know, a very mature business doing that. It's 5 to 7%, but that's great uh, and, and, very, and sort of low risk in an area which 10, 15 years ago, people would have said, oh, you can't service that. That's too, that's too high risk. And that's been enabled through the rigorous application of you know, I, you know, ICT tools and, yep. and, and data crunching. So I think it really depends sort of which tool you're trying to use to very have true. your impact. Mm. I think the one thing that all three of us can unequally vocally agree upon is when it comes to impact-driven venture capital, the returns that, let's be very clear here, the, the returns that impact VC funds look for are exactly the same as traditional VC. There is no difference. Yeah. Arguably, you might even look for higher returns because you have to cover uh, uh, bigger costs. So. And that's the same for uh, private equity as well. For so impact, it, private equity it doesn't well. matter the size. It's, uh, it's, so it's very clear to know that this is not glorified philanthropy. It's not social entrepreneurship. Impact venture capital looks for ROIs that are on par with traditional venture capital. So that as a cornerstone, what are some of the criteria that, for example, some uh, equity would look like, would, would look at when making impact investments all across the world? So I believe it's, it's uh, the criteria that you look at uh, it in any type of investment. So very traditional uh, criteria. The add-on is that uh, we have, first of all, decided on these three investment teams that we believe will have a stronger underlying growth than many other uh, investment teams in the world right now. So that is one different. Uh, and the other one is that we really use uh, uh, sustainability and the global goals, not only to reduce risk, to avoid you know, uh, child labor in supply chain or decrease uh, corruption, uh, we really use it as a leverage to get better return. We yep. truly believe if we find these companies in these investment teams and then make them even more sustainable, more circular, then they will be the winner of tomorrow. And then we also work, uh, we're looking maybe a little bit more on the teams, the entrepreneurs. Are these entrepreneurs really value driven? Do they have a strong purpose? Because we can also see, and we have some research together with, the Har with Harvard, that purpose-driven organizations are performing much better yep. than regular companies. So maybe that is something that we're uh, trying a little bit harder than other to look for. I call it profit from purpose, yes, yeah. absolutely. Andre? Yeah, yeah we, we, we take this sort of the classic three T's approach and then bolt on, obviously, mm -hmm. world positive. So it's your team, your technology, and your TAM, or total addressable market. Yeah. Now, you know, those are usually the key ingredients that you know, have this alchemical, uh, if you're successful, outcome that you have the returns you want. Then again, with our world positive approach, we start with ourselves because let's not kid ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, those who need to reform are also the investors. And Absolutely. so uh, making true. sure that we have, you know, we, 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 we put in, um, in our term sheets, we have a world positive term sheet where we ask to put down on paper what the values of the organization will be, uh, what the intent is. We look for signals of entrepreneur aspiration and intent. So that can be a touchstone because every organization, as it grows, particularly if it, becomes, if it goes public, will be buffeted by all sorts of winds and forces to try and go this way and that. And as far as we can tell, the biggest single predictor of if they make good choices is if they're rooted in their DNA in, in, a, in, a, in a place of value. Yep. And, so, and then going forth from there, we, as I said, have our selection criteria in our different buckets. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now ask our panelists, and I'll ask myself as well, about to give us one or two concrete examples of investments that either ourselves personally or through our funds have made 
into impact-driven enterprises and what specifically you like the most about them, uh, something that you're most excited about. So it could be one, could be two, and I could start if... Yeah, you start. If, yeah, start. <laughs> Okay, so we've invested in about 35 companies all across the African continent, early stage companies. The one company that I'm right now most excited about is a company called Mpost. And the biggest returns from a VC perspective are not companies that innovate product, but innovate business models. So Mpost pretty much digitizes post boxes. So about 90 to 95% of people all over the African continent and in Asia and South America do not have formal postal addresses. Now that may seem like not a very trivial problem to have, but these people that don't have formal post boxes are excluded completely from commerce. They can't have insurance policies delivered to them, they can't have goods shipped to them, they can't have bank cards sent to them. So this particular company wanted to create a digital post box. So they created a technology that converts their mobile phone number and their, and their closest zip code into a recognizable postal address. So their address now would just be John Smith 079374 yada yada yada.1002 Nairobi, Kenya. So any package anywhere in the world, be it an insurance policy or, a, or something from Amazon, would be shipped directly to the post box. And every single postal union in the world recognizes that address, and it gets delivered to you directly, either picked up or delivered to your office. And it costs $5 a year to set it up. So now you have this impact, this indirect impact of hundreds of thousands of millions of people that are now formally served by insurance companies, banks, and retailers, and that creates a huge amount of social and economic wealth. And it's done through a tech startup, but it's a business model innovation where insurance companies and banks are involved. And um, another company um, that I, I love quite a bit is a company called Gotbot. They develop chatbots for financial services firms and insurance companies, but they very cleverly teach call center workers on how to move between a human mode and a bot mode. So in regions of the world, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the majority of call center workers are women, single moms, that have to come and spend eight hours in the office and have a nanny look after their kids, you now have a robot, a, a bot, making their job more efficient. So no jobs are lost, but this particular mom could now work from home. So these are examples of two companies that are creating a lot of social good, but delivering more than 50% annual returns to investors. So impact investing should always be looked in the same lens as VC, mm. and returns will come. So on that note, just a couple so of... So I'm excited uh, of so many of our investments. Uh, but if I, I earlier been very passionate of particularly social impact, uh, I am now also uh, very driven about uh, climate. And uh, the reason why is that it's so urgent. It's really, really, so we need to find those companies that can really make a change. And we have one company in our portfolio that I think is uh, amazing. Today we know that uh, around 40% of the energy is used by in, uh, in buildings like this and 36% of the CO2 emission is coming from buildings. And that we even don't talk about. We talk about transportation, renewable energy, but this massive uh, challenge with buildings using so much energy and, and having such, such a negative impact on the environment. And we have a company called eGain, and uh, it's a smart system using really every number and figure about weather forecasting, learning everything about the buildings and bringing everything together, and then can make, optimize the building itself and That's making amazing. sure that the building only uses the energy needed uh, in every 24-7, uh, being very exact. And I think that is super fascinating, and it saves around uh, um, 10 to 20 percent of the cost also for the customers. So it's a really win-win-win 
the customers is winning because they're reducing their cost, the company is going very, is very successful, and the planet is winning. So that's, that's the type of company love it, I love really it, love uh, it. like. Love it. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> so one, one kind of esoteric but cool and concrete company is uh, Zymergen. So Zymergen uses uh, a combination of different tools, which on a standalone basis are agnostic. But when you put them together in the service of uh, green chemistry, it's quite exciting. So we use machine learning uh, as a way to power the, uh, the, the process to identify uh, compounds of uh, most probably high use in an industrial setting, but which you cannot get at industrial scale because they're naturally occurring in plants. And so what we do is we use effectively large bioreactors that are born out of the fermentation space uh, to grow the compound in question mm -hmm. for, to solve the problem. So if, you know, company X or Y comes in and says, yeah, we have an additive that we're using in our industrial process, which is really toxic or persistent and problematic. We'll say, let's find the solution that exists in nature and scale it up in a way that is light touch. And I think that sort of illustrates a lot of what I'm trying to refer to earlier about looking for the, the, the tools that enable disruption and then figuring out how to put it together to really improve the outcomes in any given space. Uh, another quick one would be, um, sure. uh, you've seen this before in EVs like in Tesla's, we have a, an investment in Proterra. And Proterra is an electric bus company. Okay. And it's completely unsexy, which is why I take this <laughs> opportunity to brag about it here. Um, it, it's, uh, but what's really cool is Proterra, just through better design, is able to do 600 miles on one charge in a vehicle which has no localized emissions, which when you add them up in urban centers is a real air quality issue. Uh, oh, even here in Europe, you have big problems when it comes to lo local diesel emissions and lower operating cost. And so you end up getting a really a better service an immediate local impact, and provided that the, that the electricity you're charging it on is green, it's a, a bit of a triple win. Very nice. Well done. We're almost out of time. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Slido. So I'm going to start with one that I think would make more sense. OK. If you think of getting critical mass to influence a certain global issue, who do you start with? The public, companies, politicians? or anyone else? Who do you start with to get critical mass to influence a certain global issue? Anna? You... Uh, I think you need to work on all these. For me, uh, partnership is the new leadership. So, uh, like so really bringing everybody together in the same room as we are now, decide on the challenge, present the challenge, show the gap, uh, show how you can uh, solve it, if you have a solution, uh, and try from there. I think we are too much working in silos. The VC world in one silo, entrepreneurs in another, politicians, academia in another. So really get together and make sure to, to, to get new perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, a bit of a trick question. Uh, I, I, you know, it really depends perhaps on when you're asking that question. So that when, when I grew up, you, you could actually go to Washington, D.C. and get things done. Uh, it seems <laughs> a bit different today. Um, for example, uh, on the end... Same in Sweden, same with, in no <laughs> with no government right now. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have the issue of you can get a lot done locally. I mean, I'm a big proponent of local action because we tend to deal with each other directly rather differently than we do in big rooms where we don't know each other. Mm. Um, we, you know, as social creatures, we, we respond differently. And also, local experimentation and problem solving is very potent because it deals with the immediate now and can also be a learning lab. But it really is a case-by-case -case scenario. If something, it's sort of stupid to go to a venture capitalist and say, could you please solve the problem yeah. on, on global carbon taxes? The answer is, no, I no. cannot. Yep. Um, you know, we can contribute to making it more politically palatable by coming up with solutions that mean that sectors don't lose in that transition. But you can't really couch the responsibility in one player. Hey, look, it's the goon squad. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank you all for listening, and thank you, Anna, thank you, Andre, thank you. This is a, a fantastic panel. Thank you guys very much but, for your thank time. Thank you so thank you much. Thank you. Thank you.